Kan jag bara en buff? Good morning, everyone, dear minister, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Thank you so much for inviting me this morning. Uh, and thank you to the host for an extremely challenging task. In 10 minutes, I'm asked to give you an update on where we stand when it comes to physical climate change, to tell you how we can speed up the transition to a renewable economy and make sure that future investments are in line with climate research, and how we can make sure that the big money meets the big tasks. So as you can see, I don't have any time for small talk, but I'll give you a few key words about CISRO and myself. CISRO is the leading climate uh, interdisciplinary research uh, institute in Scandinavia. We are deeply involved in the IPCC uh, process. One of our research directors is vice chair in working group one, and we have five lead authors contributing to the next IPCC uh, report. As Anders uh, told you, I'm not a scientist myself. I was previously a politician, member of parliament, minister of finance, minister of education and research. Uh, and I have the privilege, I learn something new at work every day. And I try to connect and interpret, translate climate research uh, to decision makers in public and private uh, sector. So, let me start its speed date. For the first time in recorded history, the average monthly concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at Moana Lua Observatory in Hawaii was about 410 parts per millimeter in April this year, reaching 410.26 ppm. The World Meteorological Organization's annual statement on the state of climate in 2017 said that global mean temperature in 2017 were about 1.1 degrees Celsius about pre-industrial temperatures. The five-year average 2013 to 2017 global temperature is the highest five-year average on record. The world's nine warmest years have all occurred after 2005 and the five warmest since 2010. So there is no doubt the heat is on. Two meteorological stations in Pakistan reported temperatures of at least 50 degrees Celsius on the 30th of April this year at the peak of a heat wave in large parts of the country's populous Sindhi province. This is the first time that it has ever been reported a temperature topping 50 degrees Celsius in April. A temperature of 50 degrees Celsius was recorded on the same day at Jaku Babad and five other stations reported new April records. Much of the Arctic Ocean and some neighboring land areas were again substantially warmer than the 1981 to 2010 average, and the Arctic sea extent was well below average. It's the end of April, and basically the Bering Sea is ice-free, when normally there would be more than 500,000 500, square kilometers of ice said the UN National Snow and Ice Data Center. The heat is on and we experience more extreme weather events. So, what can we do about it? The Paris Agreement is a bottom-up agreement without any judiciary sanctions. All countries are expected to submit nationally determined contributions and disease to the UN outlining what policies they plan to implement to reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions. The agreement is going to be updated and strengthened every fifth year. When scientists summarize the NDCs, they are not sufficient to avoid global warming above two degrees Celsius. 
we are closer to three degrees Celsius. But despite all these bad news, I'm an optimist. And that's because I've decided to be an optimist. <laughs> and because there are important signs that can, you know, support this attitude. Because after the Paris Agreement, there is no longer any questions asked about where we must go. Not among scientists, not among politicians that have knowledge of climate research and trust science. We have to transform to a low carbon economy. The Paris event gathered key people, as you can see, from the NGOs, from science, from politics and from the financial sector. Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg started their task force and came up with a strategy for the financial sector on climate risk and climate-friendly investments. And apart from the US President Trump, nearly all politicians and leaders around the world will try to follow up the Paris Agreement, not only because they support the agreement, but because they believe that this will be an advantage for their own population, their own inhabitants, when it comes to quality of life, but also when it comes to economic growth in the future. So one may, way to make sure that investments are in line with climate research is to develop independent assessments. And CICERO provided a second opinion for the first green bond 10 years ago, and we are still, big play, still a big player in this uh, market, a growing market and a very interesting market. In 2015, we improved our methodology and introduced shades of green. That was to make the message a bit more sexy. And it worked. Uh, we have re when we review a green bond, we assess where, whether a given activity or technology supports a low carbon and climate resilient society in the long term. We provide transparency for investors and make sure that green investments really are green. I can tell you some more about this <clears throat> after this breakfast meeting or you can find some more information about it at CISRO's website. So this is a very important tool. The market for green bonds has doubled every year the last three years, but it's still less than 1% of the total bond market. There is an increased interest among investors for green projects, and, <clears throat> and at the time being, the demand is bigger than the supply. And that is promising. So how can we speed up the transition? Investors will, of course, put mon their money where they can get the best return while taking the least risk. Renewable investments must become more profitable and fossil in investments must become riskier. When large investors such as pension funds, for instance, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, pull out of fossil fuels, it sends a clear signal to other investors that this asset class is not something that you want to long own in the long term. If more countries would, uh, uh, would cut back on expensive fossil fuel subsidies, the risk would increase further. In 2020, all countries must submit new and strengthened NDCs to the UN. The stronger the climate policies, the less attractive fossil companies will be as investment. How to make renewables more profitable? <clears throat> we need to start buying the products, of course. Renewable energy is close to grid parity, but still some utilities prefer fossil. According to a recent report by Lloyds, there are considerable transaction uh, costs of switching from one energy source to uh, a new one. And we need to keep pushing down the price of renewable at the expense, of course, of some investors, remove transaction costs, refine and develop storage, and make consumers ask for green electricity to power their homes and their cars. And a lot of that is already going on. It will increase in the years to come, and we will be able to keep global warming 
<clears throat> below two degrees if we decide on the right policy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, we asked Christine to set the stage for the challenge, but also for the possibilities. I think you did a wonderful job. The Business for Peace Foundation, together with Nobel laureates in peace and economics, find exceptional business people who have shown that it's possible to attend to the bottom line while also creating shared value for society. One of them is here with us today. You will meet another later. I invite Edgar Montenegro and Pilar Castillo to come up to the stage. Edgar Montenegro is the founder and CEO of Corpo Campo in Colombia. He started this cooperative of farmers, 1,600 farmers, because they were caught in producing coca, and the narcotics industry was creating great problems for them. Through transitioning into working with agricultural products that the cooperative can then sell in the market, 1,600 families have gotten a new opportunity. And Edgar is here to tell us about the climate challenges that they have. Señor Montenegro, okay. un placer. Muchas gracias. Buenos días para todos. Eh, enseñamos a cambiar el viejo, eh, el viejo modelo productivo eh, de talar el bosque para sembrar coca. Cultiva, eh, cultivo de pancoger o potreros para ganadería extensiva por un, medio, un modelo que enseña el aprovechamiento sostenible de la palma eh, nativa de la Amazonía colombiana y que, pro, que produce azaí. Estas palmas nativas ayudan a combatir la deforestación a cambio de que los productores obtengan un beneficio económico digno, continuo y creciente a largo plazo, reconstruyendo el tejido social y a la vez sembrar un legado para sus hijos y para la humanidad porque frenan la deforestación, protegen la biodiversidad y, y conservan el más grande laboratorio de la naturaleza. Good morning to everyone. Um, we teach communities to change the old production model of cutting down the forest, often done to plant coca or subsistent crops or for extensive grazing of livestock. Instead, we teach them the sustainable harvesting of a native variety of Amazonian palm that produces acai berries. These are uh, antioxidant rich berries. These native crops are best suited to combat deforestation. In return, farmers obtain a dignified long-term economic benefit. This new model not only slows down reforestation, but also protects biodiversity and conserves nature. Farmers are also able to rebuild the social foundations of their communities while sowing a legacy for their children and humanity. Hoy la selva colombiana, ese gran tapete verde de donde vengo, es más pequeño. Eh, lo están acabando. Solo en Colombia en el 2016 se deforestaron 178 mil hectáreas para ampliar la frontera agrícola, eh, sembrar eh, cultivos ilícitos, ganadería extensiva y, man, y minería y construcción de vías. La selva amazónica es, eh, eh, es muy afectada por el cambio climático. Es el segundo ecosistema más vulnerable del mundo. Allá los ríos ahora tienen menos agua y menos peces, pero más plástico y mercurio. Today, the, Amazonian, the Colombian Amazon jungle, that great green carpet where I come from, is significantly smaller. It is being extinguished. In Colombia alone, over 1,000, 8,000 hectares of forest were cleared in 2016 to expand the agricultural frontier, to plant illicit crops, for grazing livestock, for mining, and for road construction. The Amazon rainforest is extremely affected by climate change, and it is the second most vulnerable 
ecosystem in the world. The rivers there now have lower levels of water and less fish, but have more plastic and mercury. El cambio climático está alterando el ecosistema de la Amazonía. Las lluvias son más intensas y las sequías más largas. La biodiversidad, la capacidad de almacenamiento de carbono y la producción de oxígeno y las funciones reguladoras del clima están en peligro. Es urgente que nos unamos todos para frenar esta amenaza. Climate change is altering the ecosystems of the Amazons. The rains are more intense and the droughts are longer. Biodiversity, the carbon storage capacity, oxygen production and regulatory functions of the climate are in danger. It is absolutely urgent that we come together to stop this threat. Eh, juntos podemos abandonar el cambio climático de forma eh, sostenible. Les invito a contribuir para que, eh, para que miles de familias en Colombia encuentren un mejor medio de vida, mientras protegen, eh, protegen cientos de miles de hectáreas de bosque natural. Si protegemos esa selva amazónica, estamos protegiendo los pulmones del mundo. Together, we can address climate change in a sustainable way. I invite you all to take climate leadership action so that thousands of families in Colombia find a better way of life while protecting hundreds of thousands of hectares of natural forest. By protecting those Amazonian forests, we are protecting the lungs of the world. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of introducing Nigel Topping from We Mean Business. We have put some gray hairs in uh, Nigel's <laughs> excellent uh, Norwegians. Uh, I mean, the room here is full of Norwegians. Norwegians are very forthright. We ask for quite impossible things, not realizing that other nations have hierarchies and systems that may be putting obstacles in place, right? I'll, uh, I'll leave uh, Nigel to tell you about what it was like to work with us. Well, I should start by saying it's been a pleasure. I don't, I, I, and I think you've got more grey hairs than me, so maybe, the, the, uh, <laughs> maybe I've been more challenging than you think. Um, go, um, go, good morning, everybody. Um, and I would like to start actually by thanking um, Business for Peace Foundation and, and uh, the Norwegian Climate Foundation for um, hosting us um, this breakfast seminar. You know, we, we, we know that climate change is a collective action problem. Um, and we know that it's a problem of such a scale that there's no solutions without the business community being fully engaged and fully involved um, in developing the solutions and implementing the solutions at scale. Um, and uh, most businesses, um, in fact, many businesses who don't have a huge stake in the fossil fuel economy, um, nevertheless um, face lots of challenges um, in the transition. And, Uh, in 2014, um, we, a group of NGOs working with the business community, recognized that the voice of business in the climate conversation was being dominated by um, those who didn't want to see an acceleration of progress. So we formed a, a coalition, we called it We Mean Business, the coalition of seven um, partners initially, now over 60, um, working with businesses to accelerate action on climate change. And we, we formed it on the basis that most business leaders um, understand the science. Um, most business leaders see the risks and the opportunities of the kind of disruption um, that tackling climate change represents. And most business leaders want to act. But it's a collective action problem, um, and acting on your own is difficult. So um, we work with businesses to encourage them to commit to transformational changes. And the more businesses that do that, the, the, the easier it becomes. The, the best due diligence is your three closest competitors um, agreeing to do something. It's much easier to convince your board if you can point to those competitors. Um, and those transformational changes we then um, use to communicate to policymakers that the, uh, the business community is supportive of enhanced policy ambition. Um, 
let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by transformational commitments. Um, I mean commitments like businesses committing to procure 100% of their energy from renewable sources. Um, through the Climate Group and CDP, we work on a program called RE100. Companies like Axo Noble and IKEA um, committed to 100% renewable energy. Um, IKEA, for example, now have more windmills than stores. So it's a question of whether they're really a retailer or an energy manufacturer. And those 130 companies between them are buying more electricity than um, Malaysia or Poland. If they were a country, they'd be the 24th biggest country in the world. And they're already 50% on the way to implementing that. It includes commitments like doubling energy productivity. So Johnson Controls have reduced their emissions by 41% and are saving over $100 million a year in the process. Um, and it includes the overarching commitment basically to implement the Paris Agreement through a, through a process we call setting science-based targets, which is where individual companies can set their overall ambition uh, in line with the Paris objective of getting to net zero. Um, and so far, over 400 companies have committed to that. But that's an individual commitment for each of those companies. Um, and as Kristen said, we're now in the process of the beginning of the ratchet of the Paris Climate Agreement, and 2018 is the year when we need to start seeing governments step up and publicly enhance their Paris plans. So we're working with businesses to show this ambition and turn it into action and advocacy, and that's why we're so delighted as the Women Business Coalition to partner with Business for Peace on the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration. Um, because as Steiner said, um, Business for Peace stands for not just business leadership for business, but business leadership in the broader societal context and the broader responsibility of society. Um, and the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration um, is an individual commitment by business leaders to, first of all, set science-based targets, so to do their own piece of the work of implementing the Paris Agreement. Um, and you can see that as um, doing the right thing, or you can see that as doing the smart thing in terms of um, implementing a business plan which is ahead of the policy which is coming down the line. But beyond that, the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration commits business leaders to using their voice to engage with their supply chain, with their peers, with city government, with national government, to encourage everybody else to get on the journey to implementing the Paris Agreement um, to solve that collective action problem. Um, and m many companies um, have already signed and will be working closely with Business for Peace to increase the number. I think, in fact, I think as of this morning, the 23 companies have committed to the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration. Um, more than half of those are new to setting science-based targets. So that's a significant increase in the number of companies committed to implementing Paris. Um, now, this landscape where business has become a very, um, very much a partner with policymakers in addressing climate change um, did not come about by accident. Um, so just as a, a great cathedral has many, many people chopping away at stones and building the spires, but uh, only one architect, the Paris Agreement was also the work of many thousands of people. I was um, probably the high point of my career, I think, to have actually been in the halls in, in Paris with, with, with so many great people from all around the world, from all sectors, working towards the success that we had there. But the, the, there is one architect of that Cathedral of Paris, um, the former Executive Sec Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Christiana Figueres, and I'm going to embarrass Christiana now by introducing her. Um, many of you will know her, but for those who, who don't, Christiana took over the UN climate role in the gloomy aftermath of what was largely seen as a disappointment, as a failed negotiation in 2009. And in her work, she's always manifested three qualities, which I think um, you'll probably see shine out when she gives her remarks later. First of all is her stubborn optimism. That's the, if you like, the entrepre I see this as the, entre the, the entrepreneurial quality par excellence, the refusal to believe that failure is an option. Um, uh, secondly, she's a disruptive strategist. Um, she always delivers this with an infectious enthusiasm, which makes you not always realize that you're being disrupted, but just some, example, <laughs> just some examples. The, 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 this whole UN negotiation process has been turned on its head from being top-down to being bottom-up, from 
a negotiation based on mistrust to one based on openness and trust and believing that everybody will step up. Um, from one where everything's negotiated in one go to one where we can build trust over time with this ratchet mechanism. And perhaps most importantly um, for today, uh, one which was the exclusive domain of nation states, which kept out cities, which kept out states, which kept out civil society, which kept out business, to one which is a genuinely inclusive process now where so many more stakeholders feel ownership and responsibility to implement Paris. Um, and finally, um, Christiane has always been very clear-minded about the scale of the challenge and the actions that we have to take. So um, I, I have learned always to pay great attention to what Christiana says because there's always something to learn. So um, I look forward to learning something and hand it over to Christiana Figueres. Thank you very much, Nigel. Very, uh, very sweet of you. Actually, um, I have to tell you, my family have told me that I learned to be stubborn when I was three years old. Uh, and, and they do tell uh, a pretty amazing story how I stood up to my father when I was three years old, which I will spare you this morning. Um, but um, I have actually learned now with my children to disrupt to use Nigel's word, uh, disrupt the concept of stubborn. So we have collectively come to the conclusion that it's okay to be stubborn as long as it's for the common good. Um, and so now we've made it wonderful to be stubborn. So whenever anyone is stubborn in my family, we're going, how many people are benefited by that stubbornness? And if there's a critical mass, it's fine. <laughs> So that's the way we're dealing with stubbornness. So anyway, welcome uh, to the family of stubborn uh, optimists that I want to invite you today uh, to become. I would like to share two points with you this morning. The first is uh, about decarbonization, and I would like to give you several proof points that Kristen has already started, uh, that decarbonization actually is already underway. It is unstoppable, it is irreversible, uh, and it is growing actually exponentially. And my second point today is going to be that despite all of that very good news, we're not decarbonizing fast enough yet. Actually, uh, the, well, I will give you some points about the latest scientific evidence that has come out over the past three years, and uh, I will propose a pretty radical and clear boundary of emissions within which we must operate for the rest of the century. So that's the executive summary. For those of you who only read the executive summaries, I'm done. You can now leave. If you want more details, here are the details. Uh, so to decarbonization. I warned you uh, that decarbonization is already underway. It is unstoppable and it is growing exponentially. So let me give you a couple of data points on that. First, I want to talk about uh, renewable energy, the most exciting story on the energy market. Certainly, uh, solar coming down 90% over the past eight to nine years in cost. Um, and it's actually become cheaper than any of us ever thought. Uh, and continues its uh, descent in price. So already in India, Peru, Mexico, UAE, uh, uh, Emirates, Chile, Morocco, uh, the price is already under $30 uh, the megawatt hour, three cents uh, the kilowatt hour, very exciting prices, making it very cost competitive with coal. Offshore wind also coming down, not at those prices of solar, but already offshore wind in the UK, where I am living now, uh, already at $57 uh, dollars the megawatt hour. So very, very competitive costs. And honestly, if anyone had asked, uh, even the IEA five years ago, will renewables ever be that cost competitive? The answer would have been no. The answer today is absolutely and Renewables have never been as expensive as they are right now because they will continue to descend in cost. Um, there also is more renewable energy on the global energy uh, matrix uh, than we ever imagined would be possible. Since 2015, we have added more renewable energy to the, uh, to the global grid than all other sources 
combined. And in fact, we have pretty certain uh, projections that all the incremental energy supply between now and 2021 is actually going to be non-fossil fuel. Uh, so that's actually an astonishing trend that we are beginning now to truly cement into the transformation of the energy grids uh, worldwide. So it's cheaper than we thought. There's more of it than we ever, uh, than we ever uh, thought, and it is actually happening faster than we expected from the point of view of individual countries. We already have 11 uh, European Union countries uh, that have met their 2020 uh, renewable energy targets. Uh, China, did you know, has already surpassed surpassed its 2020 solar target and last I looked it's only 2018 so they are two years early and already surpassed India has done the same India is now projecting that what they registered under the Paris Agreement they can actually go 50 percent higher and they will comply with that three years earlier uh, than they had thought because solar is so competitive against coal uh, in India. In fact, uh, India uh, recently announced that all government-owned ports in India are going to be 100% renewable energy powered by next year. So if you ever doubted the commitment of China and India, there you go. Uh, we have a hundred, uh, more than 100 cities around the world that are already running on 70% renewable energy, two times as much as we had last year. Uh, and as Nigel has already pointed out, a growing number of companies, I think at this point 122 companies, that are committed to going 100% renewable. So um, that decarbonization is happening much faster than we expected and everything is conspiring in a positive way uh, to actually accelerate that decarbonization even farther in an exponential way. So where does that leave coal? Well, coal is actually on the demise, on the decline. Uh, it is recently been included in CITES list of, uh, of species that are under extinction threat. Uh, it is uh, declining really right in front of our eyes. It's important to understand why. Coal is declining and is on the demise incontrovertibly because number one of the health effects. That's very important to understand because one of the tenets of the Paris Agreement is, yes, we have to do what we have to do for the globe, but first, what is the national interest? What is the local interest? And coal is the biggest threat to national interest because of its health implications. So because we're now understanding the health implications of coal, that is why main reason but also risk that I will talk about, uh, coal is on the decline, mostly in China and India. The two countries that we thought were going to protect their uh, right to use coal, actually pre-construction coal is already uh, declining by almost 50%, by a 48% at this point. And overall, you can say that coal is losing both its social license Nobody wants a coal plant close to them because of, the, uh, because of the health implications. But also, coal is losing its competitiveness um, because of overbuild, because of competitiveness uh, cost against uh, renewables, and because of declining finance uh, for coal. The most amazing uh, recent story is the Adani coal mine in Australia that was going to be the largest coal mine in Australia, second largest in the world. Um, and they thought they would be able to open it. They thought they would be able to get the finance. Well, the fact is they did not get the finance from the Australian government that they needed. They did not get the money from the Chinese government that they needed. And, you know, things have gone relatively quiet on the Adani front. Uh, I just don't think that they'll be able to... Uh, to open that, uh, that mine, uh, and it has a huge domino effect because the coal from that mine was supposed to be taken on a big railroad over to the port owned by Adani also, a coal port, coal export and coal 
across uh, across the, uh, the the world over to uh, India to a coal plant, on and on and on. So you know, a coal coal domino uh, that because of the lack of financing, because investors have decided that it is too risky to begin at this point in time, 2018, to put fresh money into coal, an asset that is very clearly now a toxic asset uh, that has not gone forward. So. A very interesting case, uh, case in point there between Australia and India, two, uh, two countries that are really quite iconic uh, for coal. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a slew of accelerated retirements of coal, in this case, not coal mines, but coal plants, most of them in North America and uh, Europe also uh, for health reasons, but also uh, in addition because they're just simply too inefficient. They are, you know, more or less my age, many of them. Uh, and by this time, even I can't run a marathon. So, you know, the coal plants can't do it either. Uh, and it's about time to, uh, as I say it, you know, to thank coal uh, for everything that it has done. Because in the last century, much of the development that we had was thanks to coal. So it's time to thank coal like a nice little old lady. Thank you very much. Honor it for everything you did. And it is time to send it to the retirement home. Um, and just to give you a couple of data points on finance, uh, uh, also, you know, the, uh, the, the, the risk, the understanding of risk uh, on the part of financial institutions is hugely growing on coal. Uh, we already have up to six uh, trillion dollars in investment. Eighty percent of pension funds have already uh, announced they're either out of coal or will come out of coal. Thank you to the Norwegian uh, fund for for moving in that direction, but I will also list Lloyds of London, ING, BMP Paribas, HSBC as commercial banks that have gotten out of coal. Um, and then the development banks, you know, when you say, well, it's actually the developing countries that still need coal, well, guess what? The World Bank, EBRD, EIB, and AIIB uh, have all said no more financing of coal. The list of countries that have already said they're not going to use coal anymore is long. Uh, I am not going to give you the long list. It's a long list. Um, here's a very interesting point. Insurance. If you ever wondered... Who are the risk gurus of this world? Well, it's the insurance companies, right? That's why we all give them our money, because they're supposed to understand risk better than ourselves, and they're supposed to manage that risk for us. Well, the insurance companies are now getting out of coal. So now when you have the insurance companies getting out of coal, now you really have a confirmation that that is a highly risky asset. And you, the list of insurance companies that are getting out of coal includes Allianz, AXA, Zurich, Swiss Re, um, and SCORE, um, all of them saying too risky, no more insurance uh, for coal. So how on earth is coal going to operate in a world where it doesn't have insurance, it's not getting finance, and nobody wants it in the backyard. I think it is time, as I said, to thank Cole and send it to the retirement home. Um, right, the other story, fantastic story on decarbonization, uh, which has exploded over the past uh, 12 to 18 months, is electric vehicles. Why is that important for decarbonization? Because that already signals a decline, not on coal, because they don't use coal, haven't used coal in a while, uh, but rather a decline in oil demand. Um, and so here's a really uh, fun data point for you. Tesla became a company in uh, July of 2013. Four years later, Tesla actually surpassed General Motors uh, in market value. So that proves to you how quickly and how disruptive new technologies are actually coming on board. Three months after Tesla surpassed General Motors in market value, you began an incredible domino, again, a domino effect of car companies that had been investing into um, electric vehicle uh, technology, but had not announced that they were going electric, but that, frankly, they were forced by the market to say, okay, not only are we investing, but we're actually going 
to move all our models over to electric vehicles and each of them giving a hard deadline for when that is going to be the first of course because we're here in Norway was Volvo uh, very quickly moving over uh, to all models being electric thank you very much to all Norwegians who are driving electric vehicles um, but then you also had Jaguar Land Rover BMW Mercedes-Benz Volkswagen well honestly what could they do right hello uh, I mean, you can't, you know, first cheat on emissions and then begin to say, okay, we're going to have less emissions. No, no. If you cheat on emissions, then you have to go to no emissions, right? They didn't have any other option. Um, but then you go to General Motors, uh, Ford, talk about iconic companies, Daimler. Um, and just yesterday, I read uh, Rolls-Royce is also saying, right, you know, we've got it. Uh, we're going over to uh, 100% uh, uh, electric uh, models. And I just came back from the most exciting, I know nothing about motorization, I know nothing about motor sports, but I just came back from my very first race in Paris of Formula E. For those of you who don't know, those are electric vehicles that race in the streets of capital cities, and they can do so in the streets because they are so silent. Um, so it was really quite fun. I was sort of watching the cars go by because they go by at 280 kilometers an hour, but I was also turning around to look at mostly all the males in the audience who were like, where's the noise? <laughs> so there is a little bit of noise because the cars do go against the, uh, against the air, um, but because they're clean, and not as noisy. Um, now we can have uh, motorsports in the uh, in the cities, uh, and it was quite uh, quite an amazing thing to see. Actually, the excitement of young people. Okay, and that's something that I really think we have to take uh, into consideration. Next generation is totally with. Uh, a new technology, and they, they, they just don't have any patience for the technologies that we're used to anymore. Um, so electric vehicles, uh, projected cost parity by 2020. How incredible is that? How incredible is that? And on the regulatory side, again, Norway beating all, uh, all the records. Uh, Norway already regulating that all vehicles being sold as of 2025 will have to be electric. But then Scotland coming in, of course, three years earlier than UK because we have to have that little competition. Uh, and then now uh, we also have the Netherlands, France, and India. Okay, to my point also about developing countries. India already regulating that all vehicles sold in the Indian market will have to be electric by 2030. Uh, and China already saying, hmm, India got there sooner than we did. We better establish a date. So they are about to establish a date. And then we have a long litany of cities uh, that are either uh, restricting uh, diesel, such as Oslo, or restricting cars, such as Oslo. Um, and, uh, and of course, electric buses just, uh, just hitting the ceiling, in particular in China. What does all of this mean? Here is what it means, independently from the, from the data points that we now have a virtuous cycle that has started and is completely unstoppable, where you have financial risk understanding, meeting technology, innovation, and price drop, meeting policy support, meeting consumer demand. And once you get those four operating and mutually supporting each other, you have what I technically call an exponentially twirling, that's my, that's my uh, technical term, uh, an exponentially twirling virtuous cycle that is completely unstoppable and will only increase in speed. So all of that to the good news. Now, does this actually mean that we're on track to address climate change? Well, sadly, no. The fact is that decarbonization started not early enough and despite all of this excitement, uh, is not progressing fast enough. So I would like to give you, since the Paris Agreement, three science points that science points out to remind us that we are still not doing our job. Point number one, and we've already heard Concentrations in the atmosphere higher than the history of humanity, temperature records being broken, we, we know all of that. What is the effect of that? Well, three actually very concerning effects. First, last year, 
all the hurricanes that we got, in addition to being a higher number, had the highest wind speed ever, ever in the history. Think developing country destruction. Highest wind speeds ever for hurricanes. Secondly, the melting underneath the surface of the Antarctica has already started to slow down the circulation of currents around the planet that actually keep our temperature and our seasons more or less stable. When that goes, folks, we're in such big trouble. That, that, that is like stopping our own blood circulation, and we know what happens to us if that stops. Uh, very, very dangerous threshold that we're almost at. Um, and uh, for those of us who, uh, who are scuba divers uh, and lovers of the ocean, last year we already lost 30% of the corals of the Great Barrier Reef, never to be built again. Gone forever. So three data points that have happened just in the past 12 months uh, that science is very concerned about and therefore is reminding us that we actually need to speed up. Now, my favorite scientist, Johan Rockström, demonstrated what we have to do with that with a little piece of paper. So I now feel scientifically empowered to do the same for you. Um, so Johan says, okay, since that is the case, and we are still emitting 40 gigatons, 41 actually gigatons uh, per year, here is what we have to do. Let this little piece of paper be 40 or 41 gigatons that we are still emitting per year as a planet. Uh, by 2020, we have to put ourselves in the position of being able to half that so that by 20, per decade, so that by 2030, we will have 20. By the 10 years after that, we have to be able to have that again. So we're now in 2040. Uh, and by 2050, that's where we have to be with a maximum of emissions of five gigatons. And I will remind you with many more uh, brothers and sisters on this planet by 2050 and with much more economic growth that needs to happen in developing countries. What does that mean? That means that we have to be much more resource efficient, much, much more resource efficient than we have to be. We have to extract from every gram of carbon that we have much more productivity and much more benefit for the human race. But it also means, frankly, that we have run out of atmospheric space. We can no longer, we can no longer continue the trend that we have of continuing to increase the emissions in the atmosphere, she has said no more. She is full. Think of it as a bathtub. Think of the atmosphere as a bathtub where we only have a little bit more space to fill up, and then once we fill up, the water runs over with huge consequences. We only have 600 to 800 gigatons total to put up in the atmosphere, not for my lifetime, not for the lifetime of my children, for the history of humanity. That's it. So we are hitting very, very concrete uh, limits there, and we have no more space. We have run out of time. What does that mean? This is what it means. It means no more new well, coal, forget it, right? We've already sent them, you know where. Coal is gone. Oil and gas, very importantly. No more new drilling of oil and gas. No more new drilling. No more new licenses to drill. That means all the existing oil and gas wells that are currently under production need to be used because gas is the most important partner to renewables right now while we still don't have storage, okay? Very important part to renewables. They need to firm up renewables. They need to provide baseload. Existing wells, not new. We cannot afford any more new wells. We need, as humanity, to fight the natural decline of oil wells. And we know that the decline at a rate of five to maybe 10% uh, per year, that is 
the natural decline, of course there needs to be some investment into those existing wells of water and you know whatever else is done to extract as much as possible from each well. But let me be very clear. We cannot afford any more new wells. No more drilling. And here in Norway, let me speak to the Arctic. The iconic, absolutely iconic uh, oil and, uh, and gas. Um, let me say, actually, with all love, because I do love this country, with all love and respect, the Arctic is simply undrillable. As simple as that. Those wells that are there now need to be used to their maximum extent. Those companies that are there now need to protect their shareholder value. But even if, even if we know that drilling in the Arctic is being done in open waters, that it is being done as safe as all the industry can, that it is cheaper than others, that production costs are going down, and that it would be in the most responsible hands. The fact is that new wells, and new oil uh, in, uh, in the Arctic has proven to be an elusive promise. Uh, it is a very promising geographical area or geological area, but it has proven over the past few years to be an elusive promise. We have not uh, struck uh, there uh, as easily as we thought. But even if we did, even if we did, oil and gas companies should at this point, I just got a red, isn't this, isn't this amazing? I just got a red light. I don't think the red light is for me. I think it's for others. <laughs> Thank you for the red light. Um, oil and gas companies uh, really need to be, at this point, incredibly strategic. They do not want to go, you know, the fate of coal. Uh, they have to be very strategic at this point. They have to understand where are they going to put their capital expenditures and where their operating expenditures. Operating expenditures should definitely be invested into where into existing uh, oil wells and, um, and infrastructure in order to make that as efficient and low emissions, methane leakage uh, reduction, as possible in order to be able to produce the stabilizing and firming energy that is absolutely critical for the next few decades. And capex should be used, and we're looking at increasing oil prices right now, so very interesting moment for the enlightened oil and gas companies. CapEx and growing CapEx should be used to transition into the new economy. Nobody is benefited by oil and gas companies doing the Kodak thing. Nobody is benefited by that. All of us are benefited by oil and gas companies transitioning their expertise, their knowledge, their engineering skills, and their capital, and their presence worldwide into the new economy. That is what we're all benefited by. That's what their shareholders are benefited by. That is what the world is benefited by. So it seems to me that we actually owe a huge amount of support to oil and gas companies that are making that transition as long as the understanding is no new drilling. Um, that's difficult, I know. But uh, remember the bathtub. We are within a limited carbon budget. As I've pointed out, three scientific proof points that we are no longer playing house. Rather, we are endangering our house. We cannot do that. We have to be responsible. We, the adults, right now, are the ones that need to make that decision. That is not a decision and that is not a transition that we can actually delay, nor can we pass that decision on to future generations. It is ours to take and we can. Thank you.
Thank you for being so direct about the task we have ahead of us. We'll come back to this in the you know, most controversial issues in, in a few minutes in the panel discussion. I just have to ask you one, one, one question first, and that's, you know, you're presenting a very optimistic picture. Stubborn optimism, relentless optimism. When I switched on my Twitter account this morning, I saw coming in from, from China news about how the, the Chinese energy sector is, has been per, per, performing now in, in the month of April. Coal is going up, uh, renewables, yes, but coal is growing, you know, fast. We saw the, the last year uh, CO2 emissions globally increasing. We see how the, the Trump uh, administration is pulling back, for example, uh, um, uh, fuel standards. A lot of worrying things also going on in the, in the global landscape if we talk geopolitically. How, how can we maintain optimism despite all the bad news coming in? Well, first you of all, you have to be stubborn, right? First, you have to be stubborn, because as Kristen says, you have to decide which side of history you're on. That has to be a decision. And yes, you know, I've just drunk some glass, so I can choose, you know, I can choose to also read all the bad news and fall into despair, but I don't. I choose to read the bad news, understand that there are challenges, because to every story that you present, China, you know, is still using coal. Yes, it is. It has been using coal for the past 50 years. It is also the number one pro producer of solar panels. It is also the number one producer of wind energy. Um, and it is now self-defined the leader of the ecological civilization because they want to be competitive since there is another country that decided they don't want to be do it. China has decided they're actually going to produce the uh, low carbon uh, products and services that the world wants. Uh, so to every, you know, and, and to, uh, to everything that you tell me this is the bad news, there's always something positive about it. The fact is that humanity is in one of the most challenging and deeply rooted transitions that we have ever had. And this is the fun thing about it. It is a transition that is being led by our decision and by our policy and by our mind. All of the other transitions, the Industrial Revolution was actually a, a revolution that was led by the discovery of fossil fuels and then the development of the technology to use those. So it was market-led. This transition is policy-led, and it is being supported by, uh, by industry and by technology. So it's a very different transition, but it is a transition. And you know what? All transitions are messy, and we are in the middle of the messiest part of the transition. I welcome the messiness because it means we're actually doing something about it. If it weren't messy, we would have a big problem. Good, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have, we'll, have a, we'll have a couple of questions from the, from the audience. Um, and uh, Tarje Osmundsen, uh, Tarje, you have for many years been working with solar energy devel development, mainly in the global south, please. Microphone. Thank you for sharing your inspiration and for those of us who have been working on the ground for many years, it's always fantastic to be, to be uh, reminded of part of history we are, are part of and, and where we're going. I just would like to share with you some que a question regarding how we can actually help the developing countries who have not yet discovered the demise of coal to actually come to the same conclusion. Yeah. And I would like to give an example. I, this, this week and I came back from Sri Lanka. I went over there to a seminar with the inspired uh, information that, that, Nor the, that Sri Lanka with the support of Norway and the World Bank and everybody had decided to become 100% renewable by 2050. And when I come there, I discovered that actually the country is in a deep tug of war where the trade unions, the, the, the utility, is actually in a slow motion action against the utilities, the utility commission, because the utility commission say we're phasing out coal. So actually the pressure now is, with the support of the president recently, to start building new coal power plants in Sri Lanka. And it's the same thing in Vietnam, it's the same thing in Bangladesh, it's the same thing in Kenya, it's the same thing in Ghana. Those very countries, that five years ago signed the declaration 
that they were going to be 100% renewable in a separate organization, they are now relaunching coal plants. It's not because of bad will. I think we have to understand the situation. They are looking at the, what they pay for emergency power. They're paying a lot for importing fuels. So they say, what can we do? So my question to you is, if we share your vision and we want to accelerate, what can a country like Norway, what can players like this do, actually do to help those countries to avoid those terrible decisions that they are now facing, whether to restart the coal uh, investments? Thank you. So um, you had a list, I think, of about four or five countries. I could add, add about 20 more countries that are in the same, in the same situation. And um, I always reflect upon myself when I hear about, you know, our countries in a hard time, and I go, hmm, okay. On the 31st of December, of last December, I actually signed a commitment to myself that I was going to lose 20 pounds. Have I done it? No. Okay, that doesn't mean, you know, that my commitment is any less. It just means it's darn difficult to do it, okay? Um, so I, I don't judge those countries, right? I don't judge those countries for, uh, for not having done what they're committed to do. I think it's up all, to all the rest of us to support them and to make that transition easier for them. Uh, uh, and I think there are several components. Number one, uh, I think they do have to, and most of the ones that you mentioned, do have a very clear um, mapping of their renewable and domestic sources. I mean, that's the other really important thing, right? Renewable energy is by definition domestically sourced, so they're not importing, they're not using very expensive uh, currency that they have to purchase to purchase energy in. So first they have to expand everything that they can into uh, renewable energy with the support of finance. And I think there is a very important role for sovereign wealth funds, for pension funds, to really actively look at where can they finance renewable energy in these countries at actually very interesting returns, first point. Secondly, all of those countries will turn around and say renewables are wonderful, you know, we can use our own currency, it gives us more independence, and they're not firm, they're intermittent. So that's where it comes to the point of actually being able to put together integrated packages of as much renewable energy as possible firmed up by gas. Because once you have that package, then you really have a very, very interesting competition to coal. Um, and you begin to move into, uh, into the direction of 100% renewables. But all of that needs first the analysis done, the financing done, um, and the very important integration between those two. And I know that I, you know, at, at some point, I'm sure I'm going to have to get, you know, a, a, a bodyguard because renewable energy people are going to begin to want to kill me because I'm very, very publicly saying I do think that we need to marry gas and renewables in the short term. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Uh, on that screen, uh, from the, she's, she's, Amabet is, is um, working at, at ELO, the, the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for um, your continuous inspirations. Um, it is obvious that uh, many sectors and industries will have to go through major transformations in the coming decades. Um, in the Paris Agreement, parties made uh, a commitment to a just transition for workers to the creation of uh, quality jobs and decent work. Uh, just transition policies connect employment, social, economic and industrial policies to the climate goals. And uh, just transition processes clearly count on social dialogue and um, involvement by the social partners and also tripartite cooperation. So do you think a lack of ambition and public engagement for achieving the climate goals may be caused by um, um, clim climate policies not taking into account social and economic realities and a just transition uh, in a coherent way? And if so, what in your opinion needs to be done to address this? Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, and I, I would say you're right um, in saying that we haven't paid enough attention to it. Um, I think it's something that is beginning to be corrected now. Uh, and the, 
I think there is no sector uh, where the urgency of just transition is as evident as in the coal sector. Um, because that is the sector that is, you know, leaving us. Uh, and it is absolutely not fair to just because the resource is exiting the energy uh, matrix, it is not fair that uh, uh, coal workers, uh, com um, communities, families uh, actually pay the price for that. It is just completely unfair. So uh, there is actually quite a bit of progress on, uh, on beginning to segment which types of communities, families, and workers need what kind of support because we will understand that some of them need support, the younger generations um, need the support to train out of coal into other uh, productive, uh, uh, other productive uh, employment, um, and the older ones need support until they can retire with dignity, and um, and and very often. And I'm I'm thinking now actually of a coal mine that is being closed, a coal mine and plant that is being closed in, um, in Spain where Iberdrola, the, the company, has actually put a very, very interesting program in place for all of those workers to help the closing of the plant um, because it takes several years to close the plant. And by that time, they will be of retirement age. Um, now, that says nothing about the black loan that many of these workers have. That is a permanent injustice. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for the panel discussion. Could Ola Elvestuen, the minister, Martin Norton, Jens Ultrad Mo, please come, come up here. So, yeah, if you take the, the, the table on the right. Ola Elvestuen. He's since January Minister for Climate and Environment in Norway's centre-right government. He represents Venstre, a Liberal Party with good credentials regarding climate and environment. He has been member of, of Parliament and also been City Councillor for Environment and Energy in Oslo. Martin Norton is an Irish businessman and philanthropist and one of the winners of the Business for Peace Award this year. He founded Glenn Dimplex in 1973. Today the company is the world's largest manufacturer of electric heating appliances, low carbon solutions for heating and cooling. Jens Ultrad Mo is a Norwegian businessman and philanthropist, and I would add the climate activist. Uh, Ultrad Mo has significant investments in the renewable sector and is very engaged in the public uh, debate. His company Umo is also one of the founders of the business coalition Norway 203040. We'll, we'll touch upon different issues in this uh, conversation, but we have to start with your challenges, uh, Christiana Figueres, uh, to the Norwegian government. And when you have had your glass of water, I'll... I'm bringing a glass of water well, for the minister. Uh, uh, yeah, very, very, very polite of you. Uh, so, Cheers. Like a glass of water? So, so just, just to make it 100% clear yeah. for him. In case know? it wasn't, okay. Yeah. Repeat, what's your main message to him? <laughs> um, okay, the, the, the you know, two-sentence thing or two-word thing is the Arctic is undrillable. But, but here is the context for that, okay? The fact is every single other geological site is equally undrillable. My point is no more new exploration, no more new drilling. What, how different our life will be when everybody agrees that with respect to oil and gas, what we have to do is to follow the natural decline of oil wells. Why am I saying that the Arctic is undrillable? Because I'm in Norway. Uh, otherwise, I probably wouldn't bring it up. Secondly, uh, because it is the most iconic geological site of the world. And thirdly, because Norway has given so much evidence over the years of being responsible and of truly planning its economy for protecting uh, future generation interests. So because of all of that. What's your response to this friendly advice? <laughs> well, it's, um, 
Also in Norway, it's not this, it, can, it cannot be viewed just as one decision. We also have to have a transition. There's no doubt about that. And everyone here that knows in the room, we had elections last year. We also discussed where to set the limits. And we had a discussion about the uh, Lofoten uh, Westerholm, where you set the limits where there would be no drilling. Uh, in 2020, we will have a new management plan for the Barents Sea and the Lofoten area, where you also have the decision on where do you set the limits towards the north, that is also an agreement, but also in Norway, and it's, for me, it's, it's a little, who is the most to blame? Is it the user of oil, or is it the producers of oil? oil? I think it's, we are both to, to blame in that, uh, in that respect. And for us, we I can think also everyone, both together bring the solution. Yes, but I started here in Oslo. I was the first one to set up public uh, charging points for mm -hmm. electric cars. That was 10 years ago. Ten years ago, so we put the first 100 ones, and everyone said you would get to have more charging points that we would have cars. Five years ago, I opened, opened the EV17 in Barcelona. Then we had sales for electric cars on 5%, and the room was cheering. Uh, last month, or in March, we had sales of 37% of electric cars, and no doubt that Norway is leading Absolutely. in that, and we are pushing that forward. Mm -hmm. But we also have to make a transition in Norway. I think everyone here knows that the oil and gas industry had to decline. And how fast, we can disagree, but it must be as fast as possible, because demand has to also to go, <laughs> go down. And in Norway, we have to, we have to uh, one thing is that we can, we can supplant the the, the activity in the oil and gas sector, no doubt about mm -hmm. that. But we also have to make our whole country run more efficient because we cannot replace those tremendous incomes that we, are, we have had in the oil and gas industry. So we have to look at the whole society <laughs> to make this transition and make it as fast as we can, not only because we, we, we must and it's the right thing to do, but because we have to, because climate risk it's an important debate also when we look at the oil and gas industry. But you are, you are addressing the, the, the Norwegian policies, are addressing the, the demand side. The e electric vehicles, what we're doing on the demand, the ferries and so on, it's, it's on the demand side. Christiana Figueres is pointing on, on the role of the supply side in this. Stop drilling now. And that's what I said, that it, it also in Norway it has to be a transition. Mm. We have set some limits on where you can drill. That was a discussion, and it will continue. And everyone knows that also this year we have a climate risk commission that the country has set up to look at the crimes risk of the whole economy. It has delivered its report in December. When that is delivered, also the government has said we have to look at the, 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 the results of it, and then we have to look also how do we follow it up. And everyone here knows it has about the, the, the tax policies and how do we organize ourselves around our oil and gas industry. But yeah. the, there will be a transition and not just one simple decision. Jens Utvedmoe, you, you want to comment on this, I yeah. think. <clears throat> I want to comment on the bar and see. I used to be in the oil business. I still talk to them over drinks. What I hear is damn good news for the environment. The bar and see is a dead duck. Ten billion dollars has been spent on dry holes there. Secondly, all the area that we thought was full of oil, oil has been there, it is gone. The great news was the big hole drilled near the Russian border last year was dry. Still, Statoil persists in drilling 19 new holes next year. That will be wasted money, which is good news for the environment. It's dreadful news for the oil industry, because if they find something, it will be stranded assets. I can also see that you can make loads of money on the Norwegian shelf by not drilling any more, by emptying the present fields. That has a marginal cost of $15. You make loads of money. If you keep drilling, it will become stranded assets, but they will keep drilling as long as this government gives big tax advantages for further drilling. Thank you. <laughs> Christiana, would you comment that should, perhaps you should bring Jens with you when you're touring the world? Uh, let him give this message? Well, I think I have to take the minister also because honestly, you know, you, you, this, this is a complicated issue, right? And, and you have to see it from all the different sides. It's just not realistic to only see it from one side. I have the luxury to do that, but that's not, you know, the, the way to do it. Um, it is very important to be able to see 
you know, kaleidoscopically, if you will, all the different components that, uh, that affect us. So, yeah, we can all four go together on tour. <laughs> Mr. Alvesten, you had a brief comment and then we'll go on to yeah, the other well, subject. I think that's a very important point that we, we have to make sure that we're not making the wrong investment. That's definitely a decision that we, we have to, to make here. And also, when you have a, a Climate Risk Commission coming up, we also have to look at how do we have to change our system so that we are not uh, encouraging these wrong investments. And that is a big decision for the country. And we also have to make sure oil and gas is a huge industry in Norway. And we have to make sure that we have a policy so that we also lead them into this change and bring the industry with us also in the transitions that they have to make. Because a lot of the, the new industries that we have to build in this country must also come from a source and also the some companies that today uh, has been or still are also in the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry. We, and another question for you, I have a and, and, and to broaden it a, a, little, a little bit. If you look at it broadly, how can you, as a, as a Norwegian minister, encourage business to help to, to reach all those, these, those ambitious targets we have been talking about here today? Well, I think this or is... generally? I mean, the, the, what, the, the, what the Business of Peace is doing is, is uh, very good. I think that the whole idea of the Paris Agreement is that you have to mobilize society. I mean, we have to mo mobilize governments, and governments are the most important decisions to make. There's no doubt about that. And they have to increase also international cooperation. But you have to mobilize also local, local governments. You have to mobilize organizations, industry, and in the end also you have to mobilize individuals. So that everyone has to have a great, take a greater responsibility, responsibility and to have an uh, a, a environmental impact that is larger uh, or to make an impact that is larger than their own emissions by themselves. Because you have to lower your own emissions, but you also have it be more important than just what you do yourselves. And you have to mobilize, and this is uh, an important part of it. Martin Norton, uh, what's the motivation behind your engagement in the struggle against climate change? Well, I've heard some wonderful speeches this morning, full of good news and bad news. And uh, I always look at the scales of hope and fear, and this morning out of more hope uh, than fear. Uh, we went, my wife and I, to Antarctica in 2007, and it was life-changing. We sat on the deck, uh, we, went, we went as far south as we could go, and then up a fjord to a glacier, and we sat on the deck. Every so often there'd be a big roar as a piece of the glacier broke off into the sea, and I found it life-changing. Uh, the captain who was from Norway said, my chart is 10 years old and my chart says we are seven kilometers inland. So that had all gone. So when we returned, um, everybody can do their part in a small way. So I redirected my organization and we employ 500 R&D engineers. And now 300 of those are working full time on solutions that are carbon re re reducing, renewable, sustainable products. And we have some of your very exciting systems and products coming along which are really into saving energy. But that's all very well. But everybody like, needs a nudge, the carrot, the stick. And the big driver is legislation. I mean, the EU has brought out directives now. So this year, every single heater we make, we had to re-engineer, retool, huge cost, but no choice. So this is um, the, the Eagle Design Framework Directive. Room heating is lot 20, lot 1 is central heating, lot 2 is hot water. So each sector has had to, by directive, change. And um, <clears throat> we now only make smart heaters. We can't make old and efficient heaters anymore. And because we manufacture them in Europe, we are shipping from here around the world, hundreds of thousands to China, to Russia, to Turkey, which are now only smart heaters. They have small little things like um, all electronic control. If you open the window, heater says, I'm not needed, I um, I'm going to bed, switches itself off. If there's no occupancy in the room, heater says, there's nobody here, uh, I'm, I'm going to bed again. So it switches off. So they're, they're very smart, very efficient, big saving. 
And some of the products we are making now will save 50% energy, all of that combined. And there's a huge population out there, like on storage heating, um, between UK and Germany, there's 10 million. In France, with panel heaters, there are 60 million in, in homes. And half of those are inefficient and really have to be replaced. So it's everybody plays their part in a small way. Hmm, good. Jens of Dadmo, you, you moved... You moved a significant part of your investments toward the renewable sector some years ago. What are your experiences so far? And um, also, what was the re reaction from your old friends and buddies in the oil and gas business when you made this shift? I used to have quite a big oil business, about 5,000 employees. I read the IPC third report, and I was scared. I was scared at the vision of what was happening to the globe, but I also saw that it would be big change in society, and, and big changes tend to be profitable for those who see them in advance. I saw them too early. <laughs> <laughs> but I have seen, I did that 10 years ago, I have seen in those 10 years it's steadily become more profitable and more advantageous to be in renewables. If I had gone to coal, I would have seen exactly the opposite. So I'm seeing that the, dra the dramatic increase in competitiveness in renewables. So now it looks like I actually did something quite smart. And it also looks like I went into, into energy, solar and uh, ethanol from, from uh, sugarcane. Now it looks very promising. It looks promising for what Mr. Elvestuen's government has done, that the very tough demands on Norway, up to 2030, a 40% reduction, will be dramatic changes and will give dramatic opportunities. It's already happening in replacing oil and gas, but it has to go much wider. We have to go to agriculture. Uh, Fertilizer is something about the worst thing we can have. We have to look at food, we have to look at the structure of society. And this is the biggest business opportunity I've seen for some time. And, to, and, and what is more important, the tendency has been for Norwegian politicians to set a target, as they come up to it, they run away from it. That will not happen anymore because of the EU. We have tied ourselves to the mast, and if we don't meet the target one year, we have to to the next. We have 40% reduction. It is likely to be tightened. That means that we cannot buy quotas to the extent we wanted from outside, uh, from uh, other countries. So we have to do it here. That is a big change. It's a big business opportunity and it's a major responsibility for business to rise to that occasion. As I understand both both you, uh, Jens Ulfettmo, and, and Martin Norton, you, you are pointing out the politicians. You're talking about the regulations needed to, to, to produce more efficient uh, um, he, um, heating appliances. And Ulfettmo uh, are, are pointing out the, at the EU as a kind of anchor for the Norwegian politicians to, 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 um, to keep on. So, can you, can you just, Norton... Yeah, just yeah, address this uh, and make it a, a, bit, a bit clearer. Just a small point. Uh, when we were in uh, Antarctica, uh, I discovered the albatross, the most efficient bird in the world, flies around the whole planet, only using wind. And I had Bill Lishman, who's a Canadian artist, make me a life-size albatross of stainless steel and old oak for its mouth, and it hangs outside my office door by piano wire on the ceiling. And he's there looking at me every time I go in and come out of my office to remind me of um, my commitment, what I, I, I should be doing. But what you won't know, and we were talking about your friend Cole uh, in Ireland, and we are committed Europeans, um, we don't have coal. But the centre of Ireland has very large peat bogs. And for hundreds of years, 
people heated their homes by harvesting the, 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 the peat. With my dad, when I was a boy, I went out and we, we, we worked on the, on the peat bogs and we heated our home. That's now forbidden. You can't do that anymore. We have three large power generation stations there which were generated by peat. Communities living off this, 2,000 people working, harvesting peat. They've been phased out and been changed over to renewable. A lot of protests, uh, not popular among the local people, but the decision is right. Uh, government subsidies stop next year for, for, for peat in, in the power stations. So it's, it's all part of it, everybody doing a small piece, everyone doing their part uh, to achieve what we must achieve. But we do need encouragement, we do need the stick as well as the carrot, and therefore to need brave politicians to make brave decisions and be statesmen. It's easy to be a politician, it's much more difficult to be a statesman. And I think on behalf of the world... Yeah, yeah. I'll just do it, please. Yeah, and I, see, I think we have set ambitious goal. What is, well, Norway, we are, we are the closest tied non-member that is possible within the EU. And of course, we, we should have also the same, the same goals as the EU, and I hope we get a, that in place this year. But we've also set goals, like the, like the goal on only selling electric cars by 2025. And that is definitely possible to, to achieve, and we will achieve that. And that is something that we set an example that is important way outside of Norway. But the other one is also that we had a commission on, uh, on green economy. So every part of our economy and industry has set up their own roadmaps. By now, I think there's 17 roadmaps, and we're also waiting for finance to set up their roadmap. And of course, uh, our, what is important now is that these are something that is also government-driven that we have to look at what does the, what has the different part of our uh, industries and businesses need, what, are the, what new regulations do they need, and we also have, of course, support system within all and everyone, everyone knows. But this is something that has to be followed through. And, then, and that is the Norwegian part. And, of course, there, there has to be tremendous investments internationally in renewable energy in, in, uh, in, in different, different parts of the economy. And, and we, will, we must try to, get, to also take our part of those investments. But we have, we have to increase the, the Paris agreements. Uh, the goals there has to be, to be increased. As Norwegians, we have to work on, uh, as we not now set goal by the International Maritime Organization, that is a tremendous also opportunity for international shipping. We are working also on our rainforest uh, projects, trying to get a new agreement also with uh, Colombia. Hopefully, we'll get that this, this fall, but also with other countries. So we have to work on every area to have a greater impact than only what we're doing here in Norway. This is leading us into the, the, the next uh, little... Unfortunately, uh, I have learned one thing in government. I cannot be late for the king. Oh. Is that right? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. I we'll, must sneak out. Yeah, we'll let you run. <laughs> yeah, we'll let you run. Okay. Thank you so much for, for participating. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, We'll continue a, f a few minutes here. Um, and one, one uh, issue I want to touch upon is the change in mentality, change in attitude. We have seen when we've been going from the, from the if question, as you have, uh, have, have put it, to the how and when question. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you tell us a little bit, Christiana Figueres, what, 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 what has the effects of this change in mentality been as you, as you see it? If you look back, let's say, six, seven years and what we see now in the, in the general uh, attitude uh, in, in business, in politics, where you travel. Yeah, I think um, you're right in saying that there has been a huge mindset um, shift and I think that is um, exemplified in many different aspects. The, the first is I do think that we are beyond thinking of addressing climate change as being only a responsibility, which it continues to be, but in addition to being a responsibility, it's a huge opportunity. And that, you know, understanding uh, was actually not with us 10 years ago. Had it been there, maybe Copenhagen would have resulted differently. But I think, you know, the, the shift from obligation to opportunity is a major mental shift that we have done. Of course, 
Um, that, secondly, has been uh, very much accelerated by the drop in technological costs, um, by policies, by finance shifting. All of that has actually, I, I'm not sure which one is the, the cause and effect, but as I said before, there's a mutually uh, reinforcing, uh, reinforcing uh, virtuous cycle. Um, but actually, I, what I'm most excited about, and I'm actually, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about climate change, but um, I'm most excited about what the young generation is doing, okay? So this morning, I had the pleasure of meeting Charlotte, uh, a young representing the millennials, uh, as many of you in the room do, of course. Um, and what I'm so excited about this, uh, about this generation is, A, number one, they're studying, Charlotte is studying climate change in the university. When I went into climate change, you could barely find 100 people around the world who knew what the word meant. Um, and so there was definitely not enough understanding to teach a course. So A, they're studying this, but B, most importantly, they absolutely are now demanding a completely different reality for themselves, for where they're employed. They don't want to work for companies that are irresponsible. I have young people, Charlotte's age, that come to me and say, can you help me prepare for a, for a job interview? And I go, sure. And I think that they're going to bring me the questions and say, you know, how do I answer? No, no, no. Their question always is, what questions can I ask the interviewer so that I know whether they're really responsible uh, companies, because I only want to work for responsible companies. That's a completely different mindset. Thank heavens for millennials. Okay, good. <laughs> the, the, the last uh, uh, little thing I, I th thought, thought we should t touch upon here is that the fact that the, all three of you are representing small countries. Norway, Ireland, Costa Rica, each country around 5 million people. And we, we saw last week the, the ambition presented by Costa Rica's new president, Carlos Alvarado. Very, very ambitious targets. He wants Costa Rica to be the first country to decarbonize its economy totally, he said in his inaugural speech. So, <laughs> brief comment from, from the three of you. What are the most important things small countries like ours can do to help this global transition to accelerate. Jens, you move first. It's a tough act actually being a small country. Big countries can behave like bullies, like Trump is doing now. Probably what we can do is do the opposite, by being an example for the, for the proper solutions. And we do that. The example is electric cars in Norway, but we also do it by public procurement. That is very important, and a great example is electric buses. They didn't, buses used to be trucks with some space for humans on top of them, and they were powered in the same way as trucks. In the city, you have different requirements. You can go shuttle with buses. Oslo and a few other cities have gone together to demand electric buses in 2020. That means you can develop them, have a volume enough that the costs come down and it becomes competitive. That process needs to be repeated many times over. And the small countries and the cities can do that and will do it. We see it, electric bus, electric cars, electric ferries, and throughout all other areas of public procurement. Martin Norton. Yeah, I think, um, if I've been honest, Norway and the other Nordic countries are a great model for the rest of the world. I think you've been leading the charge and I started in, um, in manufacturing a long, long, long time ago. We never talked about climate change. It was of no interest. But the noise has got louder and louder. And uh, everything is leapfrogging. So you do something, and then immediately you do something, you try and do it better, and you jump again. So th there's no silver bullet. There's no one magic formula. You can say, here's the answer. It's a whole lot of small things, and you keep improving, 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 uh, and getting better. I was in London three weeks ago and I was told that um, the famous black cabs are now they have stopped making them it's only electric now or hybrid in London and uh, the, the, the taxi drivers didn't like it but you know that this is this is the decision of the city so and I think that I agree with what people said younger people I think um, are the people who will insist on it because it's um, it's their world and um, 
you know, I think that uh, we must play our part in, in, in doing what um, they will insist we do before they insist we do it. Cristiana Figueres, Costa Rica, are, they gonna, are you going to beat us? <laughs> Decarbonize the transport sector before us? We hope so. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do agree. I think uh, small economies have, uh, they, we certainly, if, even, even if we put all the small economies together, we cannot uh, make uh, a substantial dent into climate change, but from a numerical perspective, but we can definitely make an important political dent. And I think that is our, uh, that's our value add, that we can demonstrate uh, that, uh, that this transition is possible. And in small economies, it does tend to be uh, easier because we're more open, I think, to innovation. I had a, a father who's sadly long gone, who's president of Costa Rica, uh, and uh, he said to us constantly, he said, oh, Costa Rica is not a real country. It is an experimental farm. <laughs> and with that, what he wanted to say is we're open to innovation. We are, you know, willing to try new things because we know that humanity needs to progress and we're willing to take the first step. So three experimental farms here. Thank you so much for taking part in this discussion and give our panelists a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now it's time to introduce Mr. Filip Kucharski. He is Chief Operating Officer in the International Chamber of Commerce. Please, Mr. Kucharski. Wow. Different view from this side. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, address you this morning after such a, an engaging and inspiring panel discussion. Um, as Chief Operating Officer of the International Chamber of Commerce, I would first like to, to, to express our deep gratitude to the Business for Peace Foundation. The Business for Peace has, has shown great leadership over the years, uh, clearly demonstrating the potential for business to grow in a way that both creates value and advances sustainable development around the world. ICC is proud to stand alongside and support Business for Peace in this shared mission and to exhort our over six million members to be business worthy and also to encourage stubborn optimism. Um, nearly three years after the Paris Agreement was adopted, we find ourselves in a pivotal and sometimes harrowing mo moment as the world grapples with the singular global challenge of climate change, the stakes have never been higher. And yet, in reality, we are not on track to, to, be, to get to below a two-degree de scenario. One thing that encourages me, though, is what we've seen here today, that even faced with a lack of public trust, business is responding in the best possible way by taking concrete action. More companies are leading now on climate change and uh, climate action today than at any other time in history. And the reasons for this are simple. A failure to effectively tackle climate change would be extraordinarily bad for business. And as we have heard today, the case, the case for climate change makes solid economic sense. We need to help businesses of all sizes, especially SMEs and MSMEs, those small companies, to, to show them that they can actually grow and prosper by moving towards a low-carbon world. There is no business-as-usual scenario, and it's up to us to determine what the future of business will be like and what the global economy will look like. As the world's largest and most representative business organization, ICC is fully committed to the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Within the UNFCCC, uh, we've been the focal point for business and industry for over 20 years, and making us the voice of the global business community in the UN climate process. This role has been amplified by our status as the only private sector observer to the UN General Assembly. Our climate team was recently in Bonn, uh, at the Bonn climate negotiations, where, among other uh, actions, ICC has been playing a key role in the Talanoa Dialogue. As some of you uh, may already know, this process seeks to, for the first time, 
mainstream input from business and other non-party stakeholders, including business input into the UNFCCC deliberations. This step is a recognition of the progress that has been made in viewing business as a credible partner for climate action. No solutions are possible without strong action and commitment from business. ICC's role as interface between policymakers and business is key to this. Many recent stories have shown how business has taken action. The Climate Action 100 Plus Group, for instance, brings together over 250 investors with nearly uh, $33 trillion in assets who are committed to engaging companies to improve their climate change policies. Nevertheless, more must be done and the pace of change must be accelerated. To enable business to go even further and faster towards the Paris Agreement goals, strong policy frameworks are essential. We urge governments to fulfill uh, their mandate to, oper to operationalize the Paris Agreement of COP24. This will send a strong signal to business that there is a real political will to tackle climate change and at the same time grant companies the certainty that they need to make those important long-term investments in new technologies and sustainable growth. We have found that the relentless focus on moving from words to action is not just uh, only the best way to build trust with various stakeholders, but is also the best way to mobilize business into the climate process. So in response to today's, the theme of today's launch, can the private sector become effective and trusted on climate change? I would say that it's through being effective that the private sector will be trusted long term on climate change. So I'm confident that together we have the tools that will make this lasting and effective change. Um, I'd like now to introduce Per uh, Sexagard, who's the founder, the creator behind, and the executive chair of the Business for Peace Foundation. Um, Per's vision and foresight has been an inspiration, inspiration for all of us. And the Business for Peace Awards always create great excitement within our members at ICC around the world. We share the same ambitions towards responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and business-worthy practices in business. Yeah. Three, three, there is on. Okay. I want to thank you all for taking part in the launch of the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration. We were talking about small countries being role models. We're talking about business becoming role models throughout the world. We're talking about the honorees, some of them present here today, being role models for how business should think in the future. The Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration asks that companies step up to climate. For example, Lease Plan, who's just signed the declaration, has a fleet of 1.7 million vehicles. By 2030, the whole fleet will be zero emissions. That's stepping up on climate. Or Enagas, an energy company from Spain, is working diligently to identify and engage with stakeholders with a particular attention to environmental impact and reducing negative externalities. Unilever, IKEA, DNV, Olam, I could go on, all committed to work with their entire chain, the entire value chain, identifying opportunities to reduce their emissions while increasing their efficiencies. This is important work and necessary work. Another of our signatories, Finance Norway, recently delivered a report stating, and it's very relevant to what Christine was saying, that certain areas of Norway could become uninsurable in the not so distant future because of extreme weather and climate risks. When the Paris Agreement was finalized, the private sector was given a tremendous responsibility. Governments had not done enough a call went out to the private sector to help achieve the goal. 
I was present in Paris at the time, and it was easy to sense that the agreement had sparked business to evolve from looking at this as a sacrifice, to start seeing it as opportunities. The Oslo's climate leadership declaration is a specific one. It asks for climate leadership. It wants ambitious science-based targets. It demands that signatories are advocates for effective climate action along their value chain and that they use their leadership voice in society. Basically, it demands that you are business worthy, worthy of the trust of society. We hope that the initiative will inspire and help define climate leadership in business. We look forward to continue our work with the Mean Business Coalition and the network of our global partners, the ICC, the UN Global Compact, the UN Development Program and PRI, and with all our Business for Peace honorees. And not at least the city of Oslo, a global, a global climate leadership uh, example among cities, voted to be the environmental capital of Europe in 2019. Think about this, a global partnership between cities and businesses, that would be inspira inspiringly powerful. Together we will help and try to help rally the global private sector to climate action. I want to say thank you for our speakers today who generously shared their time, also to the initial signatories who are well on board. We believe there are many that will join in the, years, in the time to come. And there is also some key Norwegian companies that signed up, like Agder Energi, DNV, as I mentioned, Finance Novice, as I mentioned, Reneas, Sturebrand, and not least, Umo. I also want to say a special thank you for, to Georg Kell, who was quite inspirational in the start in saying we need to define climate leadership. Thank you, Georg. Yeah. Mm. And thank you to many of our supporting partners, some of who are represented here today, specifically to Women in Business for engagement and support, and for the Climate Foundation for inviting us to co-host one of their important climate breakfasts. The web address of Christiana Figueres is globaloptimism.com. That is what is required. Global optimism, anchored in the kind of realism that science can provide and business can execute when it steps up. And anchored in being business worthy to solve problems that can create value both for your company and for society. Because we can create no greater value together than will, what will result if we tackle climate change together. That's a value that will be appreciated by the generations following us. Thank you. Then it's up to me to say some, a few uh, closing words. Thank you all for spending this morning with us here today. Thanks to Business for Peace for choosing us as a partner for the, the breakfast meeting. Later today and tomorrow, many of us will take part in the meetings and seminars that are part of the Business for Peace Summit. This afternoon, the famous chef and author, Jamie Oliver, will give a speech over at the university. So will Alessandro Dermayo, uh, Dem Dermayo see the new CEO of the EAT Foundation. Uh, uh, tomorrow, there will be seminars, Building Trust, Accelerating Climate Leadership. And tom tomorrow evening, the Business for Peace Award Ceremony will take place in the City Hall. If you want to attend, please register at the Business for Peace website. If any of you want to watch and listen to what's been said here again, you'll find the video at the Energy and Klima website. Remember that you also can subscribe on the newsletters from Energy and Klima and Klima Stiftelsen. We also recommend you to learn about Klima Partnere, a public-private partnership for climate action that we are operating in the county of Hordaland, and that's active now in many places, many counties around the country. And finally, a big thank to Kablifonde, the Kabli Trust, our partner and supporter. Our next breakfast seminar, again supported by Kabli, will be over the summer. We haven't decided the subject yet, 
but we'll keep you informed. And please now eat the rest of the food before you leave. We don't want any food waste. Thank you all again and have a nice day in beautiful Oslo.